morning, my friends. Good morning. I'm happy today. I got a little glide back in my stride. Yeah. <laughs> Feeling much better uh, compared to last week. Hey, we had a great time at Outdoor Church. Amen. We had close to, I don't know, 75 people, maybe 100. It was really nice. We even had people from the park attend, and they ate the veggie dogs. <laughs> I'm not sure they knew those were veggie dogs, <laughs> but it was, uh, that was the purpose of it. Uh, we, we had a good time. I want to um, share with you something that's on my mind before we get into the sermon. I haven't talked with this about the elders, to the elders or to the church board or even to the church because I don't know what it's going to turn out to be. It's an idea, and I'm needing feedback. Um, I have a big idea, and it's a big one. <laughs> but it's something that I want to do. It's something that's been laid on my heart, and I don't know if it'll work out. If it doesn't, okay, we go back to, to business as usual. Um, so I got into contact um, with 3ABN because I feel like here we are presenting the gospel every week. We started out with the wheel of faith, which is the message of righteousness by faith. We went through that series. And so I think that here we are presenting the gospel every week. Everything ties back to that wheel in some way, whether we did it through the sanctuary service or independent service sermons. They're not independent. Everything goes back to the gospel in some way. And so I, I contacted 3ABN, so very soon the sermons are going to be under review to see if they meet criteria, if they're okay, if they're theological, and then if it passes through that stage, that series that I had already recorded here, um, then I get the green light. But as all things, there's cost, <laughs> a lot of cost, a big cost. The, the upfront cost to put those 11 lectures um, at a one-time showing on 3ABN with the idea that um, support would come back into the ministry so that we could continue doing a weekly or a monthly sermon from this location um, on 3ABN. So the initial cost is $20,000. Um, so if that is something on your heart, if something you're interested in, if for whatever reason, I know it is like the sons of Anak are there, Lord. <laughs> We're grasshoppers in the sight of this idea. But... You can always get a hold of me through this church or through Will of Faith Ministries and let me know your thoughts on this. I'll be presenting it to the board later on to see what our thoughts are and what we might can come up with and do. And um, pray that we can have a consistent message of the gospel from here. I think that the Adventist Church has lots of great programs, but I just don't hear the message of the gospel being persistently presented in a consecutive systematic way that people can start to move into it and understand so that's the burden that's what i want to do i would like for conroe to be the place that that comes out of to the advent world so there you go what happens we will see anyway okay so today man working hard at resting <laughs> some of you don't work some of you work hard at resting but in the wrong way i think if you was to ask the, the one thing that, that my father taught us, and he wasn't the kind of fuzzy dad that sat down and said, okay, I'm going to teach you this lesson. But my dad taught us, if there was one thing he taught us, and it was how to work hard and to work very hard. I mean, we mowed the grass, we dug the ditch, we hauled the hay in the summertime for the winter, we cleaned out barns, we worked as kids, we worked as young men, we worked when we got our first cars, we worked to keep our cars, and I've worked my whole life very, very, very hard. It's just part of, of what was put into me as a kid, and that is something that has always been with me. And all my brothers are the same way, very, very hard workers, and God has allowed us to overcome obstacles, to be successful in various aspects of life because of that hard work. And my dad today, who is 83 years old, is still working very, very hard. So now at 52, when the doctor said, you need to start resting a little bit, and wife and family members saying, you need to slow down, you're wearing your body out, and um, I have found that to be very difficult to rest. I have found it to be work, something I have to try to strive 
to slow down and rest or I'm going to wear myself completely out in other ways. And that is really the idea of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. That was our text. The idea that Paul says we have to work is actually the word. Some say diligently to enter in or to strive to enter in. But we have to work to enter into that rest. If we don't work to enter rest, we will fall short of it and not have that rest. And of course, that rest is everything. So our idea today, we're going to learn how to work hard at, at resting. And this is the example um, I want to talk to you about what, what Paul was getting at in Hebrews chapter 4. What sparks all this conversation about resting and working hard to rest? And it really comes out of his chapter 3, and he gives us an indictment against his people. Chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, he says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. And so Paul is talking about there's a rest that we need to enter into, but they did not enter into it in the rebellion, or as some translations say, in the provocation, or in simply the wilderness experience. When they come out of the Red Sea, and they're standing there, and they're facing the desert, this is the time period that we're going to be talking about. Paul says they fell into disobedience, and because of that disobedience, they could never enter into this rest that God's talking about. And so what I want to do is kind of go through that narrative. If you're in the book of Exodus, the whole story after the Red Sea crossing, when they're standing there on the, on the edge of the desert, it really runs all the way through the book of Numbers. There's just a lot of bunny trails in and out of there, things that are going on and happening, but it's one giant um, narrative. And what I would like to do from Exodus 16 to Numbers chapter 13, is talk a little bit about that disobedience because it's a huge background to what we want to talk about as far as it relates to entering into the rest. And so I'm going to juice down those chapters into kind of their highlights so that we can see that something begins to emerge. Um, you know, they was already having issues with Moses before the Red Sea crossing, but at the Red Sea crossing... This is three days later. They're standing out there in the desert in Exodus chapter 15, verse 24. Here's the first mention of the Hebrews. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Verse 25. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it in the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them right verse 26 and he said if you diligently heed the voice of the lord your god and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes i will put none of the diseases on which i have brought out brought on the egyptians for i am the lord who heals you verse 27 then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees so they camped there by the waters there is a a formula that is all through Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and it's this. God commands them to do something. He commands them to trust him. They say, we're going to trust you. Then the Lord brings them into a situation and tests to see if they really trust him. Do they really have faith? And then, of course, they get tested and they fail. They complain. They murmur. They sin. God says, oh, my goodness, come back to me. They repent. And then God always provides after they're murmuring. So there's always this testing, this stressing, this seeing where the people are. We see it in Exodus chapter 16. So he provides the water, right? He gives them the water, he makes it sweet, and then he gives them these 12 palm trees. And then within a few days later, we're in chapter 16, verse 2. And how are they described again? The same way. Listen, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and you know what they were complaining about. They said, okay, you gave us water, but we are starving to death for food. We're hungry, and the Lord has brought us here, and he's going to let us starve to death. And, of course, 
The rest of the story, verse 4, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. It's this scenario. It goes all through the scriptures that he's going to test them to see whether they will walk in my way or not. So we leave Exodus chapter 16. You think they should get the point by now, but within just a few days, in chapter 17, their canteens are running low again. <laughs> chapter 17, verse 2 through 3. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me, and why do you test the Lord? And the people thirsted and they for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us, our children, and our livestock, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so Moses goes, he entreats, he leads them back into repentance. And of course, verse 6, Behold, I stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all of Israel. So once again, God tests, the people complain, they repent, God provides. So they should have learned their lesson by now. We get to Exodus chapter 20, and now we're at the base of Mount Sinai. This is going to be the place that they camp out for a whole year now. In Exodus 20, verse 20, to let you know what's happening, and Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to... To test you, and that his fear may be before you, and that you may not sin. To see, do you really have faith? Do you trust? Do you believe? So God has come to test them. In, in verse 23 through 21, we get all these statements. I'm not going to read them all, but, but they are statements that God has made. Chapter 23, verse 21, he says this, Behold, I send an angel before to keep you in the way. Verse 21, I want you to obey me. Verse 22, I will be an enemy to your enemies. Verse 23, I will cut them off. Verse 24, I will take uh, the sickness away from you. Verse 26, I will fulfill the numbers of your days. Verse 27, I will send my fear. I will cause confusion on them. I will send the hornets and drive them out. I will drive them out before you. I will set your bounds to the Red Sea. I will deliver you. God is saying, I want you to trust me. I'm going to test you. I will deliver you, take care of you, feed you, take care of your illnesses. I will be everything you need me to be. I want you to hang out here on the mountain, and I'm going to test you. And then the next, the next statement we find is chapter 24, verse 18, and Moses disappears for 40 days. Now, 40 days all through the Scripture is a, test, a symbol of a testing time. Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days. They're here 40 days. So there's always this period of testing. So Moses disappears for 40 days. The people are left down there on the mountainside. And they're supposed to be trusting in God. But what happens in Exodus chapter 32? Verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they begin to complain they have no leader. They begin to complain that Moses has been consumed by the fire up there. We're left here to die. No one's going to take care of us. This is the disobedience that Paul is talking about. This is the disobedience in the provocation that kept them from entering that rest that Paul says is so important that we enter into. I remember reading through all this this past week, going through Exodus all the way through Numbers, and then in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, which is a commentary on this section, I read all of those chapters, like seven chapters. I read them twice, and at the end, uh, Mary, I turned to Mary on the couch the other day, and I said, man, these were some bad people. This is like, but this is the point of the lesson. 
This was the worst of the worst. They seen unbelievable manifestations of God. His voice, they heard, they said, okay, we're going to do it. And then two days later, they do the same thing. Then they see God, he forgives them. And then two days later, they're doing the same thing and the same thing. And then worse things. And it's like, I, I don't understand that. I mean, I know we're bad people, but I mean, if God showed up here today and manifest his glory and presence and said, I want y'all all to be here tomorrow morning at six o'clock, I'm Pretty much can assume we'll all be here. But these guys will be like, oh, we'll get there at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or we'll skip and come next week. And so you would expect that God would say what he was supposed to say because that's how I was feeling. I'm reading the narrative. Man, this is a terrible people. And in verse 5 of chapter 33, I'm like, oh, okay, well, God's finally had enough. The Lord had said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So I, I, I y'all are insane. So y'all just you strip off your ornaments, all this pride and junk you got all over you. I want you to get into humiliation and sackcloth. Sit over here and I'm going to decide what to do with you as a people. And I'm thinking, well, I don't blame him one bit. This is what Paul is saying. You were disobedient. You couldn't. God said, I swore in my wrath, you shall not enter my rest. Well, I don't blame God. But what does God do with the people? This gets interesting. Verse 33, chapter 33, verse 14. Actually, 13. Moses says, now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. What does he do with the rebellious people that are stiff necked, that continually, constantly fail him? disappoint him, sin against him, don't trust him, doesn't believe in him. He's saying, I am going to forgive you. I am going to go with you. My presence will be there, and I am going to give you rest. And then Moses asked him some amazing things, and God makes some amazing promises. Verse 19, then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. What is that rest? That God is promising to give them because it has everything to understand in Hebrews. What is the rest that God said, I'm going to give to you, Moses, despite who you are, despite what your people are? Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will give compassion on whom I will give compassion. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. So it will be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face cannot be seen. And then this event happens in verse six as God is doing this with Moses as he's covering him. The Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. This is the rest that he said, I want to bring my people into. I want them to know that I am going to forgive them no matter what. No matter what they do, no matter how evil they get, I am going to forgive them. That is that entering into rest that Paul said God promised to, but something went wrong. It is a scene of the judgment, actually. I'm going to set you on the rock, and when my glory passes by, you know that God's glory consumes sin. It consumes wickedness. And, and God is telling Moses, look, I know you're a good guy, but you're a sinner like everyone else. And if my glory passes by you, it will consume you. So I am going to take my hand and I am going to cover you. This is a picture of the atonement. This is a picture of the day of atonement. This is a picture of the righteousness of Christ covering us so that when the glory of God is revealed on the human race, we get passed by. We are not consumed because we are covered and this beautiful idea that God says, I will have forgiveness and mercy and goodness on whomever I choose to. For whatever reasons I choose to, that's my business. That was the promise. That was the rest that they were supposed to enter into.
And Paul says we've got to work to enter that rest. This is the very idea of righteousness by faith in the book of Hebrews. And he's getting all of his ideas out of the Exodus. The very concept of righteousness by faith is that God is going to bring his people to a place and understanding of what they actually are. Not what they think they are, but what they are. And when they see what they are, then they know. Then they can cry out and God can say, I will have compassion. I will forgive you. I will cover you. Just come to me to be covered and, and to trust me. God wants to give us rest in that. Rest from our faithlessness. Rest from what worries us. Rest from the things that make us feel like we're not good enough. We're not going to enter in. And this is the great lesson that he's trying to teach in Hebrews 3.11. We're bouncing back and forth between these two books. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. So there's something here that I don't understand. In Exodus 33, he says, I will give you rest. And then Paul in Hebrews chapter 3 is saying, he's repeating that God said, they will not enter my rest. So if God says you're going to enter my rest and then they didn't enter my rest and that has everything to do with us today, then it, it would behoove us to understand why is it they didn't enter that rest. And just to say disobedience is such a shallow how pool understanding. There is something more here we need to look at why they did not enter into that rest. What went wrong? Go back to Exodus chapter 33. Here is the secret what went wrong in their life, why he wanted to, but they didn't. Back to verse 14. We've read it once. We'll read it again. And he said, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? Except you go with us. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. What is the key, what is the key thing to receive in this rest that God promised to give them, this forgiveness, this grace, this mercy? What did he say that, that makes it possible if I... Go with you. If my presence is with you, I will bring you into that rest. You have no, no chance of failure or a little, but not much. If I go with you, I will bring you into that rest. Because if you're going with me, then you're going to be following me and I'm going to be doing what? I'm going to be testing you. I'm going to be proving you. I'm going to be urging you to get back up. I'll forgive you. Come on, let's go again. And I'm going to test you over and over and over and over again until I bring you into that rest, that place where you have faith and trust in me no matter what's going on in your life. If God goes with me and he said, I will go with this people, <laughs> I know he's going to go with us. If he'll go with them after all of that, surely he will go with us. The story reaches its conclusion of why they failed, though, to enter that rest in the book of Numbers. Because it's just the same narrative. It's just it takes a while to get there. But in Numbers, the story picks back up and it reaches its conclusion a year later. Numbers now is a year later. They've been at the base of the mountain for one solid year. They went through the whole golden calf experience. They failed and then God brought them back. And now for one year, Moses has come down and given them the, the instructions to build the tabernacle which was an illustration they was to be studying and looking in. He gave them the sacrificial system. Uh, they had given all kind of rules, statutes, judgments, and laws to ponder and to think about and to be taught. No more testing. For one year, there's been no testing. You failed, 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 failed. A year break, learning time, listen to Moses, and now it's time to get up and go into the promised land. Now comes testing time again. 
And so our story picks up in Numbers chapter 13. You know what happens. God says, okay, I'm going to send the spies out. Twelve spies go out. It tells us in Numbers chapter uh, 13, verse 25, that they go out for 40 days. Okay, we know what that means. It's a testing period. The people are left to wait. God sent the spies out. They're at the borders of the promised land. The twelve go out. And God is now going to test his people once again. But this test is bigger than any other test that they've been through because the 12 spies come back and they're talking about all the goodness of the land and they see the fruit and the promises they're about ready to enter in. And then the 10 spies say, oh, two said, hey, we can do this. Let's go take them. But 10 say, oh, the sons of Anak were there, these giants. These massive, gigantic, monstrous people. And the land devoureth itself. It eats up the inhabitants. It's, it's a horrible place. We'll be consumed. We're like grasshoppers. There is no way. The walls are like a zillion feet high. And, and there is just forget about it. But Joshua and Caleb say, uh-uh, God is with us. Don't worry about that. They have no power, Joshua said. (laughs) Yeah, they're big. They're giants, but they have no power. God is gone from them. And so when you look at really what is the issue, chapter 14, verse 6 through 9, a little snapshot. But Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore his clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly a good land. And if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. (laughs) Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. In other words, we're going to eat them for breakfast. That's what he's saying. They are our, we're going to eat and devour them. I don't care what they look like. God is with us. He's not with them. So have no fear. And that's really the essence of why they never could enter in. They never had that faith to trust in God. They kept constantly looking at the situations around them. Look at how big everything, how problematic everything was, how troublesome everything was, how impossible it all was. And that was the issue. I have seen people, I have seen people live the most debauched, debased lives. And God turned their lives around and they become pillars in the church. I mean, you study the story or look at some of the stories on 3ABN, some of those testimonies like Sharice Peters or, or other drug addicts or people that have just had butchered, messed up, jacked up lives and just, just lived lives, just threw it out there, profligate living, just messed up. And then God take that person and restore that person. God forgave that person. God, God gave them grace and mercy and then God restored them. He sent the spirit and transformed and changed. If God can do that for one person, he can do it for any person. If he can do it for one marriage, he can do it for any marriage. If he can do it for one church, he can do it for this church, for any church. It is always the message. That's why God takes the worst of the worst. He took the worst kind of people. You remember, he said, I didn't choose you because you were a great people. I chose you because you were the worst. I mean, you look at the sons of, you got Jacob and you got Isaac. And you got, then the other side, you got Esau. You got that whole other side of of Semitic people. They never fell into idolatry the way that Jacob's sons did. Ishmael never fell. Ishmael was circumcised by Abraham and his descendants never fell into the gross debauchery of idolatry like the Israelites did. They were the most unfaithful people of the land. And God always does that. He chooses the worst of the worst. He does something wonderful in them and he says, look, if I can do it for these guys, I can do it for you. I can heal you. I can fix you. I can help you. But you've got to have rest in me. You've got to turn to me. You've got to have faithfulness in me. You've got to quit looking to yourself and quit thinking you're beyond help. And we can even take it into the spiritual realm. We've got to quit saying that I can't be saved or I'm not good enough or I don't feel like I'm saved because I look at my life and I don't see much good in it. But God says, don't be looking at your life. That's not what righteousness by faith is. Faithfulness is looking at how good he was and trusting in his goodness before me. And I will save you based on that, and I will do the same in your personal life. I will help you. 
but they couldn't get that in their head. Of course, they trusted in their own course what their own eyes could see. And you know the story. They chose to listen to the faulty spies and chose to start complaining and murmuring. Verse 11 it says that the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? How long will God's people continue to reject him by disbelieving him? Because that's what, that's what disbelief and lack of faith is. It is rejection and rebellion against God. So I don't mind asking God every now and then, hey, I need $20,000 for this huge project with 3ABN so that we can enlighten the world with the everlasting gospel, as poor as I may present it. I don't mind asking God, hey, we, we need a, another worship place. We need more here. We need more baptisms. We need more, more professions of faith. We need more transfers. We need to grow and bust out of the seams so the world can get glory and understand the gospel from this place. I don't mind asking God big things because he's a big God. If you're going to ask him anything, why ask him small little things? Look, the doctor can fix my knee. I don't need God to fix my knee, though I did pray. But I don't need him to do that. I need him to fix some other problems that I can't work on. They've chose not to trust him. It was rebellion. It was murmuring against God. But look, man, God always does this. It's amazing. Now, again, 40 years later. Well, no, this is not 40 years later. This is a year later. They're back up to the promised land. They're ready to go in. They rebel and murmur again. And like God says, for the tenth time you've done this to me. And what does God do? Numbers chapter 14, verse 19 through 23. Moses does what he always does. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. They will not enter that rest. What is different this time than the other times? What is different? Why has God now all of a sudden said, no, nope, you're not going to enter that rest. You can't make it. I've promised it to you. I want to give it to you. Paul, 1,500 years down the road, is going to talk about the very fact that you didn't enter that rest. But I was going to give it to you. Why didn't they? Remember, God said in the beginning, if I will go with you, my presence will be with you, and I will give you rest. Now, here is what happened right here. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. Here is why they did not enter that rest. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night, and the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? In verse 4, very telling. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. This is what's different. Do you see what's different? This is what's different. If you read this in the patriarchs and prophets, at this point they said, you know what? We're done with you. We're done. We're going to get another leader. We're voting him right now. In fact, brother so-and-so is going to lead us back. We've given up. We're tired of this. We're just going to go back and die in Egypt. And God said, then that's where you need to go. That's where you need to go. If you're going to turn your back on me, after all of this, if you're going to select another leader and just go back and rather die in Egypt than live with me in the wilderness, you will not enter my rest. Until the desert you go. That was the difference. God cannot go with us if we choose not to let him go with us. If we choose not to go with him.
They grieved away the Spirit of God. And I am telling you, this is where all complaining, murmuring, discontent, aggravation, resentment, jealousy, it always, every time, 100% of the time, ends up right here with you leaving the church, with you leaving your marriage. It always happens that way. We continue to indulge a spirit of murmuring and complaining and backbiting. And I don't understand why God's doing this to me. I don't understand. I don't understand. I, I, I just, I, I don't even want to be, God, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm out of here. I'm done with the church. I hear it all the time. I, I'm done with the church. What you mean is you're done with God. Be honest about it. And you're done with God because you've indulged complaining and backbiting and murmuring for a very long time. And this is where it always leads. I will guarantee you it. God said, don't do that. Enter my rest. Resist that complaining. Resist that murmuring. Resist that and have trust and faith and turn to me. Don't let that overtake you at your board meetings. And Paul explains it beautifully. He just hits it right on the money back in Hebrews. He, he tells you that's exactly what happened to them. Back in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Oh man, the gospel, they refused the gospel. Paul's saying it was the gospel they rejected. And it makes such great sense once you start to understand what the gospel is, right? We've been going over that for a year and a half together. That's exactly what they did. By rejecting God, by not having faith in what he could do, they was refusing to look at their own sin. That's the real issue. Their, their problem wasn't that Moses wasn't their issue. The problem wasn't that they, there was giants in the land. The problem is their own faithlessness, their own sinful indulgence desires. They refused to look at their own internal sin, and instead they turned and blamed Moses. They rejected conviction. They rejected repentance. They rejected acknowledgement and confession of sin. They rejected the justification by faith in God's righteousness at that time. They rejected it. And when they rejected the gospel, they was left wide open for rejecting God. The exodus narrative is one gigantic object lesson because Paul says in Hebrews 4, 2, he says, for the gospel was preached to them as well as to us. And he's connecting Hebrews 3 and 4 to the Exodus story. He's connecting them. The reason why you might not receive this rest is because maybe Damon Sneed, maybe you have rejected the gospel. God, his plan of salvation is to always drive us into the wilderness of Zen. Always. He always does this. He never does not do this. He drives us into the wilderness of Zen, or some translations, the wilderness of sin. I think that's better. And there he puts us into some difficult situations. There, through our, our marriages, can be our wilderness of Zen. Uh, a difficult job, a difficult employee, a difficult boss, a difficult family, a difficult in-laws, a trying, troublesome situation, a disease that comes upon you, something debilitating, whatever it is. He drives his people into these situations to test them, right? And you get to choose during that test once God reveals your sin. You're complaining, you're murmuring, your, your, your self sense of self-justification, the desire to, to, to backbite or gossip or retaliate or whatever happens when those things happen. And the temptation is to complain and murmur or you can confess, acknowledge, God, I get it, I see it. I see it, I see it. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. Bring me back into your favor. Help me, Father. And that is how we're restored. That is how we enter into that rest. And God says, yes, of course. I will cover you with my righteousness. I will forgive you. I will impute my life to you. And your sentence of death is imputed to my son. Come on in. I will restore you. I will refresh you with my spirit. This is what life is all about. 
And this way we learn obedience. We learn faith even when we can't see it, even when things don't make any sense, even when the sons of Anak are devouring up the land all around us and we're but grasshoppers in the sight of it all. God says, have faith in me. Trust me. Don't sin. Don't disobey. Don't gossip. Don't murmur. Don't complain. But come to me with your issues and problems and you will enter into a rest with me on a higher level and you'll never turn your back on me. It's easy to indulge in a spirit of self-justification, self-righteousness. It's easy to blame Moses, right? Well, we love to do it. Who is our Moses? Sometimes my Moses is Mary. Sometimes it's Dwayne Newman, my head elder. Sometimes it's my church board. I've said it. My Moses Sometimes it used to be my employer. Sometimes it's my children. Sometimes it's life's situations, sicknesses, disease, problems, issues, debt. Those are my Moseses. But if there's any really Moses to blame in my life, then call me the son of Amrad and Jacobed. I am the only one to blame. My lack of faith, my lack of trust, my lack of turning to him, my desire to turn to you and to complain and to self-justify and tell you about my own oh feel sorry for me feel bad for me that's just and every time I do that every time I indulge that I am rebelling against God and if I don't stop it I'll eventually turn my back on God how many pastors do you know that used to be in the ministry are gone 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 because they indulged a spirit of murmuring complaining constantly continually until they left the faith they should have turned to God with all their heart and soul and mind and had faith in what he can do. Amen. Even if Moses was wrong. Let's say like Desire of Ages, it brings us out, our patriarchs and prophets. They thought that Moses was trying to lead them through the desert until they all died off and that he could take all their gold that they got from Egypt. <laughs> well, let's say that that was true. Let's say that that's exactly what Moses was trying to do, that, that God really wasn't leading them, or he, God was leading them, but secretly the more people die, the more gold I get. Let's, let's say that that is true. Let's say that, that my Moseses are actually to blame. There is some fault in what they've done. My, my wife was actually wrong about that. Or, or, or the pastor, you, you was really screwed up about that. You shouldn't have said it that way. Or, or maybe the board was wrong, or that elder was, shouldn't have done that. Maybe that is true about them, but this story, this gospel, entering to his rest, always demands that you don't look to Moses. It always demands that you look inward, and that even if what someone done to you is true, God is trying to, through that situation, show you something about you. But the constant proclivity that we are trained to do since childhood is to say, uh-uh, Toby did it, Travis did it, Mama. We're constantly programmed to self-justify. We're constantly programmed to look to someone else, to blame it, to get it away from me, to cast it, to project it, to throw it over here, and to somehow be innocent. I am the king of this. I hate to be wrong. I hate to offend. I hate to hurt people's feelings. And I'm immediately trying to make it about, well, I can't be, well, I didn't mean that. Well, I didn't do God's like, Damon, you, you may not have thought you did, but you did. This is who you are. Own it, brother. Just, just stop all of this other stuff and, and rest in me and I will forgive you. I will forgive you. I promise you. I always will forgive you. I will cover you in my righteousness and then I will restore you. This is how we enter into that rest. And look, even if, even if it's wrong, look, Matthew 5 through 7, Christianity 101, the Sermon on the Mount. If they slap you in the face... Turn the other cheek. If they despitefully use you and persecute you, pray for them and bless them. God's like, I'm going to send you into the wilderness and some good people and some bad people are going to do bad things to you. I'm going to allow it to happen because I'm trying to show you something about you. And I need you, Damon, now not to get focused on them. I'm going to deal with them. Da Mary, don't fake focus on Damon. I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to deal with Damon. Damon, don't focus on Mary because I'm dealing with Mary in her own way. You need to focus on you. Why did you say that? Why did that aggravate you? But, but, uh, 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 uh. 
Okay. And we need to let God keep doing this until Moses begins to emerge. We need to let God drive us into this desert's experience over and over and over again until the light begins to beam from my face. That's what he wants to do. He wants me to let him just keep driving me into these experiences until I can stand on Nebo's heights and say, oh, I see it. This is where you start entering into the rest. I see Texans are kicking off football season this year, Thursday night. I, I, I see something better. Amen. No, I don't care. It's opening season. I don't care. I see something better. I, Damon, I want you to keep looking at me. I know Trump is tightening the lead. <laughs> Riding with Biden there. He's, he's pulling ahead 10 points in the swing states. I, I see something better. Amen. No, I ain't getting caught in that, Damon. You got someone mad at you again. Someone's upset. Someone's accused you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, in, I'm entering into the rest. It's pulling me up. I feel it. And I, I like this place of faithfulness and trust and love. And, and I like this place of honesty, actually. God, you see it all. And keep showing me more. I'll keep confessing. And, and I... It's this place of rest because I'm telling you, it is beautiful. It, it is freeing. It, I don't got to play games for nobody. I don't got to impress anybody. I don't have to lie to myself or no one else. Yep, what you see is true and God sees more. And I am in this place of rest with God. And physically too, I can ask him about 3ABN and if it's his will, he'll do it. If not, okay, well, I'm going on to something else. This is how we get there to this rest. This is where Moses found himself. Listen to this. This is from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. When God called for Moses to come up into the mount, it was six days before he was received into the cloud, into the immediate presence of God. The top of the mountain was all aglow with the glory of God. And yet, even while the children of Israel had this glory in their very sight, unbelief was so natural to them that they began to murmur with discontent because Moses was absent, while the glory of God signified his sacred presence upon the mountain and their leader was in close converse with God, they should have been sanctifying themselves by close searching of heart, humiliation, and godly fear. That is how I got to start to spend my time. When, when I am in this wilderness of temptation, when things happen to me or come upon me, Issues or troubles or sorrows happen. I've got to start when I feel that temptation to start. Blah, 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 blah. It's time to start searching my heart with humiliation and sanctification and saying, God, I'm not sure. But what do you see? What's going on? Why have I feel this? Why am I reacting this way? This is the safe place, the only safe place. With fallen human beings, we to stand up and do anything else is dangerous. That's what Jesus said, right? I love what Jesus said because he surely backs all this up. Now you might look at Matthew, the 11th chapter, in a different light. Now that you've looked at resting in Hebrews, resting in the book of Exodus, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take from me and learn of me. I'm going to show you how to enter into that rest. In my darkest days, the end of my 33 years of life of rejection from the world, two disciples abandoned me Traitors, Peter and Judas, the disciples fled. Pilate and Caiaphas in Herod's court, surrounded by a world of people that were mocking and jeering and beating and making fun. He says, I want you to learn of me to know what this rest is. An entire world that did not believe in who I was, though John said I was coming from heaven. 
I was the word. I was before the world was. I came. I created this world and they didn't believe a word I had to say. And finally, I found myself not only in a court, but hanging on a cross between two thieves. And the last person in the world that believed in me was my mother until I asked God this question. And when she heard me ask this question, even my mother said, he's not the Messiah. When I asked God this and I said, why have you forsaken me? No one believed in me then. And I looked up into the heavens and all I saw was blackness and darkness and quietness and your voice could not be heard. And I said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's how Jesus entered into the rest in faith and trust in his Father. And of course, three days later, Gabriel shows up and removes the tomb, tomb and he comes out and he says, now learn of me. Whatever you're going through in this world ain't nowhere near like that. Amen. I want you to enter into that rest. Damon Sneed, I want you to have faith. The next trial is coming soon. There's been a lot of peace going on. That knee ain't nothing. There's some stuff coming in your life, in my life, in your life. There's things coming in this world that's going to drive us all into this wilderness experience. And God said, you've got to learn to have faith. And to have faith is to accept the gospel, to let me show you what I need to show you while it's time to show you. Because I can forgive you, I can cover you, I can grant my righteousness to you now. And you can learn to have trust in me now because you're going to need it later. And all those that's indulged a spirit of complaint throughout their whole life, a spirit of murmuring in that day, they are going to be swept away. Just like that, gone. Paul says in Hebrews that we can enter that rest. Hebrews 4, verse 3, listen. He says, you can enter this rest. For we who have believed gospel words. Those of us that's believed in repentance and confession and justification and righteousness by faith. Those of us who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Those disbelievers, those ones that refuse to have faith, those ones that refuse to look at their own life and constantly blame Moses. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Those Old Testament Sabbath keepers. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those whom first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And again he designates a certain day saying in David. Today after so much a long time as it has been said. Today if you will hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Very, very, very important idea here. Right? David, I mean, Paul is making his case. He's saying that even though they came into the promised land with Joshua, Joshua really didn't give them rest. Or why 400 years later would David in the Psalms say, they have not entered my rest? He's making this huge point. That entering into the physical promised land was not really entering into the rest. you got to enter in physically, but you must enter in spiritually as well, or you're not really in that rest. He's saying that Joshua didn't really lead them in, even though they did enter the promised land. They entered that physical rest. They never entered into the spiritual rest. And so the, the point can be made just because you become a Seventh-day Adventist. Just because you enter into the institution, the building, the physical property, the fundamental beliefs, the prophecies, the teachings, the church positions, the board positions, the tithe paying. Because you enter into that, you have not entered into his rest yet. You must enter into the rest through the gospel. Paul is warning us, be careful not to confuse the institution of Adventism with entering into the rest, because that's the mistake they made with Joshua. And even our beloved Sabbath keeping. We Seventh-day Adventists love to keep the Sabbath, and rightly so. It's in the Ten Commandments. It is not on Friday, 
like Muslims keep. It's not on Sundays like Protestants and Catholics keep. It is on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It's part of the Ten Commandments. We honor that. Even Joshua said you should keep the Sabbath holy. Be sure to keep it holy, Joshua told them. But you cannot keep the Sabbath really holy until you enter into the rest. And he makes it absolutely clear in verse 9 and 10. Because he said, right, he's already mentioned, for God spoke of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the Sabbath from all his works. Then verse 9, there remains a rest for the people of God. Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Here is the beautiful thing about Sabbath worship. Just ceasing from your labors is honoring the commandments, but it's not entering into the rest. The Sabbath is a symbol of entering into another man's works. The Sabbath is this beautiful symbol of resting in what God will provide for us in the ways of justification and sanctification. What God can do in my life and what God has done for my life. True Sabbath worship, true Sabbath meaning, Paul links to resting in the gospel. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you believe in works. The very fact that you're here is a symbol of resting from your physical labors, not going to work, is screaming to the world that you believe that we are saved by a rest that Christ alone can give. And the Sabbath is a symbol of that. That is why it's the sign of God. But to truly enter into Sabbath worship, you must enter into this rest, which means you must receive the gospel, which means you must let God drive you into the wilderness and reveal your sin and then have no problems repenting and confessing because he will always cover. And the Holy Spirit will always feel. That is the work that God wants to do. Listen to this. The history of the wilderness life of Israel was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God to the close of time. That's us. The record of God's dealings with the wanderings of the desert in all the marchings to and fro and their exposure to hunger, thirst, and weariness and in the striking manifestations of his power for their relief is fraught with warning and instruction for his people in all ages. The varied experience of the Hebrews was a school of preparation for their promised home in Canaan. God would have his people in these days review with an humble heart and teachable spirit the trials through which ancient Israel passed, that they may be instructed in the preparation for the heavenly Canaan. Many look back to the Israelites and marvel at their unbelief and murmuring, feeling that they themselves would not have been so ungrateful. But when their faith is tested, even by little trials, they manifest no more faith or patience than did ancient Israel. When brought into straight places, they murmur at the process by which God has chosen to purify them. The obstacles they encounter, instead of leading them to seek help from God, the only source of strength, separate them from Him because they awaken unrest and repining. Paul is trying to drive us to this place to where we can finally say, okay, I want to enter that rest. When I went to Weimar, right before I came here, and now I can probably, after being here in a year and a half, I can make some, some analogies about this place. What I thought I was, what I thought God was trying to do in my life, I, I, I liken it to a snow globe. Right? In a snow globe, when it's sitting there for a long time, this, everything that you don't want seen is on the bottom. All of that stuff on the bottom, the snow on the bottom, like it represents... All of the stuff that I don't want to see, I want to stand in the bubble and look at the clear water and look around at all the little houses and little trinkets inside, you know, see all the stuff just right. I got everything worked out just right. I'm doing this. I'm a pastor. I pay my tithe. I, I, I'm a Bible worker. I do this. I got, I got all these little ducks. I can see everything clear and I can stand there. But all the real stuff that I don't want to see is underneath me. When I went to Weimar, even when I came here in some certain circumstances, God took the snow globe of life and <laughs> and all of a sudden, all the stuff that I didn't want to see, whoosh, that's all that I could see. But this was a process of God. And the temptation in both Weimar and here in my early days, the, pro the temptation was always to murmur and complain 
and start looking at this person, this brother, this sister, what they do, what they don't want to do, what their fighting's going on. I can't, you know, this or that or my, I mean, that's always been my temptation. But God has always put me in these places to shake up my life so that what I can't see, I can see. And when I finally can see, God says, now look up here. Don't look at this stuff no more. Amen. Trust in me. Look to me. Return it to me. Have faith in me. Trust me, Damon. I'll forgive you. I'll restore you. I know you messed up, and they know you messed up. She knows you messed up. You know you messed up. I know you messed up. I forgive you. I restore you. If they want to hold that against you, that's their problem. If they want to keep blaming Moses, that's their problem. That's her problem. I need you to move on and keep entering into that rest. And this is what, how Hebrews closes out now. As we close our, our time together in this lesson, this is how it closes. Now you can understand Hebrews 11, 4 verse 12 because it makes sense in context of what we've been saying. Verse 11, he says, Let us therefore be diligent. Let us work to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Right? This, this is God, the word through my life, through my character, through my word. I am going to bring you into life. I'm going to stir up your life. Because you're going to have to give account to me one day, so i got to get it all stirred up so that you can see it, so your crystal little bubble world gets foggy and hazy. I've got to do that. The Word of God does that. It's dynamite. It says it's powerful. It says it's living. It's alive. But he says, as he closes out, but don't worry, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Not let me hold fast my perfection. Now let me hold fast my holiness. Let me hold fast to my confession. I get it. I understand that I have a high priest. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let Damon Sneed therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and to help in time of need. That's the end of the story. Hallelujah. So send me on into the desert again. I pray this all the time, and you know that I've said it enough that you know I'm telling the truth. I tell God all the time that my favorite movie scene from Christian movies is Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments where he's driving Moses into the wilderness and it's, it's, it's Moses falling and he's dropping all his stuff and, he's, and it, he finally falls into the dirt, into the dust and he says, now, you know, driven into the desert where holy men are made and, and where you come to the end of human strength and as he falls into the dirt, he says, now the metal is ready for the maker's hand. I pray this all the time. God, you take your gigantic self, your hand, your foot, and you crush me into the dirt from which I came. And ignore my cries, ignore my screams. Lead me to true and deep, meaningful repentance, God. And lead me into that rest that you alone can provide. And I'll never have to worry as long as we continue to do that. So our appeal today, my friends, is simply this. Do you want to enter the rest? Does anyone... Like, okay, I know what that means now in Hebrews. I know what Jesus meant. Lord, I want to enter that rest. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, with all our heart and soul, we see that even our Savior, Jesus, entered into that rest. Help us to enter into that rest. We know what it means. We, we've seen the Old Testament played out and Paul helping us to be reminded of what it means. And today, Maybe more so than any generation of human beings, we need that rest that Christ alone can bring about that process through the gospel. Help us to embrace our life situation and not murmur nor complain, but look to you with faith, trust, and hope. May you bless us to this end, we pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.